Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Before we start with our today's analysis, we have a quick general reminder. As part of our knowledge series, our future lectures will be about some of the important topics from the static part of the UPSC examination. This includes earthquakes in Himalayas, goods and the services tax, decline of Mughals, Reserve Bank of India, ocean currents, WTO and agricultural subsidies, heat budget of earth, Sufism, Ramjet technology and hypersonic weapons, right to freedom, Saga doctrine as well as the Paris Agreement. So please do tune in live on our YouTube channel every day at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. and you will understand everything about these topics. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says technology is no panacea for custodian debts. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. The article here is speaking about the custodial debt. It says that in India what we are currently witnessing is large-scale custodial debt which showcases the police brutality and non-accountability of the police. As a result what the author says is that we have multiple other options that the police can look into. This can be use of the technology. However, technology also has its own limitations as well. So the author says that there has to be structural reforms that has to be bought into when it comes to the policing. Before we understand what this article is, we also have another video with respect to the knowledge series where we have recently discussed about the police reforms. We have also discussed what are the loopholes in the police system as well. Please do look into it. Let us try and understand what this article speaks about with respect to the custodial ditch. When we look into the statistics, the article says India has a grim record in police brutality and custodial violence. Between 2001 and 2018, 1,727 persons died in the police custody, but only 26 policemen were convicted for such deaths. What do we mean by custodial death? Let's assume for a moment there is a person who has done a crime and this particular person is put behind the bars. So what do the police do? They have to investigate and they also have to retrieve the truth from this person who is put behind bars as well. But in most of the cases, the culprit or the one who is accused may not reveal the information as well. In that case, what the police use is called as the third degree treatment. The third degree treatment is nothing but torture and if they don't reveal in such case there have been examples as well where this has led to loss of life of the accused or the person who is behind the bars. So custodial death is nothing but a person who is accused of a particular crime is behind the bars, he is in the prison but because he does not reveal the information the torture goes up to such a level that this person loses out his life. This is what is called as custodial death. So this article currently goes on to say that instead of of using third degree torture instead of employing brutal methods what the police officers may employ is called as the technology so if you are able to use the technology in that case you don't have to use the third degree treatment says this article what is the technology this article highlights about the first important technology is in reference to the body cameras so what we have is the cameras that can be installed in the police stations and at the same time there can also be body cameras as well with respect to the accused so that this holds all the officers liable as well so in case there is any issue then there is evidence that we have with respect to the body cameras and we would have the police liable for such penal provisions. Then what we have is called as the deception detection test. What is this deception detection test? As the very name denotes, deception is nothing but lying. So if a person lies or he tries to mislead the police officer, that is when deception detection tests come into picture. So let's assume for a moment there is a person this person has committed a crime let's say a murder he also has other things that is used let's say for example knife or he might have used the gun as well so he will not reveal this information to the police officers so what the police officers can make use of is called as the deception detection test so this deception detection test basically deploys technology such as polygraph narco analysis brain mapping and could be valuable in learning information that is only known to the criminal regarding that particular crime. What will happen? 
and accused in this case will be put through all these tests and ultimately they would be able to extract the information. So basically in this deception detection test a person who is lying whether it is truth or not will be ultimately extracted with these deception detection tests. Among the DTTs the brain fingerprinting system is an innovative technology that several police officers contemplate adding to their investigative tools. BFS has proved helpful for solving crimes, identifying perpetrators and exonerating innocent suspects. Laboratory and field tests for the BFS at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Central Intelligence Agency and US Navy has demonstrated no errors, no false positives and false negatives as well. So this technique helps investigating agency uncover most of the truth when it comes to the complicated cases. However, if we have to use this technology, is it absolute? It need not be absolute. There can be some errors as well. There can be errors which they may not be able to figure out as well. In fact, we also have the Supreme Court of India which has also said that if such technology has to be used, you require the permission of that individual. So in Selby versus the state of Karnataka, the court observed that the state could not perform narco analysis, polygraph and brain mapping tests on any individual without their consent. So what did the Supreme Court of India say? The Supreme Court of India said that when it comes to the narco analysis or the brain mapping or the lie detector, these tests that are conducted on that particular person will go against the will of the accused. So this person is directly not giving the consent. If you are giving the consent, then it is okay. But if that person is not giving the consent, in that case, it is violative of Article 20 of 3 of the Constitution. So this provision is clearly against privilege against self-incrimination. So it is violating the fundamental rights. So this cannot be done, says the Supreme Court of India. So the Supreme Court of India in this particular case clearly said if consent is given by that individual, you can go ahead and conduct it. But if the consent is not given, you need not have to conduct that test, said the Supreme Court of India. Added to it, when you speak about the narco analysis, it also constitutes the mental torture. It also violates the right to life under Article 21 as right to privacy is part of Article 21 as well. So all these deception detection tests amount to invasion of the privacy and then if you are extracting some information that is only known to the accused, there might be some of the data which is very private as well. This is something to do with the privacy. So if you are extracting the information without that person's permission, in that case it is also violating Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, says the Supreme Court of India. So on one side, yes, technology will help. But on the other side, the party, the person who is accused, whoever is involved in that particular crime will also have to give consent to this particular technique as well. If the consent is not given, in that case, you cannot go ahead with this particular practice, says the Supreme Court of India. This is one such practice, one such technology. There are other relevant technologies as well. The second is in reference to citizen facing services. What do we mean by it? Most of the citizens of India do not wish to go to the police stations. Why? Because they have a negative vibe in the police station. They assume that the police will not reciprocate back in a in a very sensitive way and at the same time their interactions they feel may not be pleasant as well. So by providing digital access to the police stations, citizens can also avail services from the comfort of their home. What do we mean by it? Let's say for example you have an issue. Let's say there is a person who is abusing you, who is threatening you. So instead of you going to the police station, you can access this police station digitally. You would be able to file a complaint to the police station on a digital mode. One such application has been developed by the Punjab police. The Punjab police has a citizen facing portal called as Sanj which provides online services for downloading first information reports, searching for stolen vehicles and lost mobiles among other services. So these digital portals also provide an easy and a transparent mechanism for all the citizens to register their complaints, provide feedback and also track their complaint status as well. This can also be done. So 
what we are making use of is the technology so that this can ultimately be avoided so that you don't have to face the police officers directly is another one the third is in reference to the robots police departments are increasingly using robots for surveillance and bomb detection many departments now want robotic interrogators for interrogating the suspects and many experts today believe that robots can meet or exceed the capabilities of the human interrogator partially because humans are inclined to respond for robots in the way that they do not do the humans what is the advantage of the robo when it is the police officer what we have is the human to human interaction so in this case another person who is the accused may not reciprocate back to the questions of the police officers but if it is the robo which is asking the question in a way that that person would be able to understand so there is flattery that can be used by the robo it can shame that person as well it can put that person into a diplomatic spot coerce him and strategically use his body language to extract the information yes we know for the fact that machine learning and artificial intelligence can be embedded into that robo and if the robo is trained over a period of time it can use its intelligence to extract the information so from his studies human computer interaction researcher joseph weisenbaum concluded that suspects might be more receptive to opening up to automated conversational counterparts than the police so we also have statistics which have said that we can extract information from these accused not directly by employing the police officers but instead by making use of the robots so what we have to do is we have to ensure that the artificial intelligence is embedded into the system train the robo in such a way that with all the eye movements voice and other qualities and making sure that the accused is put in a spot the robo is able to extract the information however there are also valid concerns with respect to artificial intelligence and machine learning and making use of the robots as well what are these issues one whenever we speak about robo what we are doing is giving the information teaching it but there can also be bias with respect to the robots as well there can be bias with respect to one of the communities as well and then what we will also have is a constant surveillance put by the police officers as well and this not necessarily can give 100% output is the first major criticism the second major criticism is we spoke about the bias let's say for example in united states of america we have certain kind of biasness towards the blacks and in india we might also have certain kind of biasness with respect to a particular racial community or with respect to a particular religion so on and so forth as well so if this bias is also trained to the robo the robo will interrogate in such a way that it may give us errors in the near future so basically we have the robots and the technology which can be used but this will not give us 100% result so what is the way forward what is the author trying to explain so the author says what we need is the formulation of the multi prong strategy by the decision makers encompassing legal enactment technology accountability training and community relations so this is not about just use of the technology what we require is a multi stakeholder approach on one side what we require is the law the law should be clear it should be explicit if there are police officers who engage in such activity they will be suspended immediately and legal action will be taken we already have the laws but this has to be made even more stringent as well so added to the legal enactment we can make use of the technology we can keep the police officers accountable as well and ultimately what we also require is the larger participation by the community people the law commission of india's proposition in 2003 to change the evidence act to place the onus of proof on the police for not having tortured suspects is important in this regard so when whenever there is an accused who is tortured who goes to the court of law the court of law will ask him a question have the police officers tortured you in this particular case it is the police officers who have to prove to the court of law that they have not tortured the accused as of now the accused has to prove it but in the near future the police officers also have the responsibility to prove that they haven't tortured 
to the court of law is another recommendation. Besides, stringent action must be taken against personnel who breached the commandments issued by the apex court in DK Bus was a state of West Bengal. This was a landmark judgment which also spoke about tortures as well as the custodial death. What did the Supreme Court say? The Supreme Court said it is the duty of the police officers not to use the third degree methods while having any investigation and interrogation from the accused and at the same time whenever the police officers are interrogating a particular case what they have to do is have a balanced approach to extract the information even from the hardened criminals the author also says the draft bill on the prevention of torture 2017 which has not been seeing the day needs to be revived as well so that all these police officers are kept under check and there is accountability in the system. So the author concludes, yes, technology may make policing more convenient, but it can never be an alternative for compassionate policing established on trust between the police officers and the citizens. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about the landslides in Manipur. What is the context? There were landslides that happened in Tulpul in Manipur and this article here is primarily focusing on the landslides that have taken place especially because of the man-made causes. Let us try and understand what are these landslides and what needs to be done going forward in order to prevent them. When we look into the article first we have to understand what is a landslide a landslide is defined as a movement of mass of rock debris or earth down a slope the following are the effects of the landslide so once a landslide takes place in a particular area what could be the likely consequences lead to economic decline so a lot of economic activities will come to a standstill and as a result people would not be able to do their activities this will lead to economic misery decimation of the infrastructure loss of lives of the people, affects the beauty of landscapes in that area, impacts the river ecosystem as well and indirectly it put costs such as lost timber, fish stock, so on and so forth. So when we speak about these landslides, they can be classified into multiple types based on their movement. One is what is called as the falls. These are the sudden movements of loads of soil debris and rock that break away from slopes and cliffs. It occurs as a result of mechanical weathering, earthquakes and the force of gravity. Then we have slides. This is a kind of a mass movement whereby the sliding material breaks away from the underlying stable material. Then we have topples. Topple failure encompasses the forward spinning and movement of huge masses of rock, debris and earth from a slope and this type of slope failure takes place around an axis near or at the bottom of the block of the rock. Then we have the flows and this type of landslide is categorized into five earth flows, debris avalanche, debris flow, mud flows and creep which include seasonal continuous and progressive as well. With this we have understood what is a landslide, what are the likely consequences of a landslide. We did also look at landslides classified by their type of movement. Now what we will understand is the causes. When we look into the causes this can be broken down into natural causes and it can also be broken down into man-made causes. When we speak about the natural causes, the most often seen happens to be the prolonged precipitation. What is this prolonged precipitation? Let's say in an area, there is constant rainfall. This can be because of the monsoon season or it can be because of the cloud burst as well. So if there is excessive rainfall in that particular area, what we have is a stable land. The stable land will not be able to withstand this precipitation for a longer period of time. It becomes weak and ultimately this may May result in the landslide as well. The next happens to be the earthquake. So whenever there are seismic activities that happen for a long time, this has also contributed to landslides across the globe as well. This also has happened in India as well. So any movement, tectonic plates movement, the soil covering them also moves along with it. So the seismic activity will also result in the landslides. Then we also have volcanic eruption as well. This can also trigger the landslides and if eruption occurs in a wet condition, the soil will start to move downhill instigating a further landslide. Then what we have is the erosion. Erosion caused by the sporadic running water such as the streams, rivers, winds, currents, waves wipe out the latent and the lateral slope and thus 
what we have is landslides in an area then finally we also have the forest fires as well which can also trigger the landslides they can instigate soil erosion and bring about floods which might also lead to landslides as well then what we have to look at is the man-made causes the major man-made cause happens to be the deforestation landslides can happen because the large number of trees that are present in a particular area are removed there is felling of trees that takes place and as a result because deforestation is a major problem it can also result in the landslides and finally human activities like mining or quarrying removing the vegetation cover lowers the groundwater retention and ultimately it increases the risk of flooding so landslides occur due to loose debris excess floods during an earthquake heavy rainfall as well as the mining activity in fact when you consider number of regions as well what we are engaging is in the construction of road and at the same time what we are increasing is the infrastructural projects and at the same time what we are increasing is the construction of the dams in the Himalayan region and in the northeastern region as well all this can also trigger landslides in a particular region in the present context what we have witnessed is landslides in Manipur so this article currently goes on to say that this is because of the man-made causes and as a result of this tragic disaster there are many people more than 30 people who have passed away so this article currently goes on to say that whenever the government is considering any projects railway construction infrastructural development it has to see whether that particular area falls under the landslide prone area so remember when we speak about landslides what we have is the vulnerability zone we have the high very high vulnerability zone high vulnerability zone moderate to low vulnerability zone what is very high vulnerability zone this happens to be highly unstable relatively young mountainous areas in the himalayas and the andaman and nicobar they have high rainfall region with steep slopes in the western ghats and nilgiris the northeastern regions along with areas that experience frequent ground shading due to earthquakes etc and these are the areas of intense human activities particularly those related to construction of roads dams etc are included in this zone then what we have is the high vulnerability zone where areas that have almost similar conditions to those included in the above area the only difference being the combination intensity and the frequency of the controlling factors then what we have is moderate to low vulnerability zone areas that receive less precipitation such as trans himalayan areas of ladakh spiti undulated yet stable relief and low precipitation areas in the Aravali, rain shadow areas in the western and the eastern Ghats and Deccan Plateau all experience occasional landslides as well. So when we consider the northeastern region, they belong to the very high Azad zone, they belong to very high vulnerability zone. So if the government is engaging in any developmental activities in the northeastern part, it can be Manipur, it can be any other state as well. What you have to do is first conduct a survey that if this is a landslide prone area, and if there is all certification given by the specialized agency only then go ahead with it or else please do not go ahead with it says this article so the government of the respective states as well as the government of India must now look at whether there is sufficient soil and stability tests that are done with respect to that particular project and only then initiate this project says this article so what is the way forward all those activities that trigger landslides should be strictly regulated institutions and bureaucrats who grant permission for these type of projects with the absence of due process should be held accountable for the loss of lives and property and ultimately what we require is a multi-sector approach where we have to formulate a positive land use policy and scientists should be able to predict monsoon in advance because precipitation is the major cause of landslides so what we require is a much better warning system says this article it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says the functioning of the national investigation agency the article here is speaking about the functions of the national investigation agency so what is this national investigation agency this happens to be a central agency which is mandated to investigate all offenses affecting the sovereignty security integrity of india friendly relations with foreign states and the offenses under the statutory laws enacted to implement international treaties agreements conventions, 
resolutions of the United Nations, its agencies and other international organizations. These include terror acts and their possible links with the crime like smuggling of arms, drugs and fake Indian currency and infiltration from across the border. So the agency also has the power to search, seize, arrest and prosecute those involved in such offences. And do not, from the preliminary examination point of view, it is headquartered in Delhi but it also has branches in Hyderabad, Gauhati, Kochi, Lucknow, Mumbai, Kolkata, Raipur, Jammu, Chandigarh, Ranchi, Chennai, Impal, Bengaluru and Patna. Why did the NIA come into force? That is because let's go back to the year 2008. What we had was a deadly terrorist attack. So this happened in 2008 where some of the terrorists from Pakistan, what did they do? They attacked the financial capital of the country. This led to a lot of bloodshed. Large number of people lost their lives as well. That is when the government realized what we required is one of the agencies to look into how that particular crime has been committed. Who are the people who are included in that particular crime? What is their objective behind that particular crime? And how do we have to put these people behind the bars and extract every kind of information? So we required an agency and that is what led to the establishment of National Investigation Agency. The Home Minister then said agency would deal with only eight laws mentioned in the schedule and that a balance has been struck between the right of the state and duties of the central government to investigate more important cases. Finally, the bill was passed in the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Assent was given to it and what we have is a law in the form of an established agency called as the National Investigation Agency. So what are these scheduled offences? The List includes Explosive Substances Act, Atomic Energy, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, Anti-Hijacking Act, Suppression of Unlawful Acts Against the Safety of Civil Aviation, SAR Convention Act, Suppression of Unlawful Acts Against Safety of Maritime Navigation and Fixed Platforms on Continental Shelf Act, Weapons of Mass Destruction and the Delivery Systems Act, Relevant Offences under the Indian Penal Code, Arms Act and the Information Technology Act. In September 2020, the Centre empowered the NIA also probe under the Narcotic Drugs and the Psychotrophic Substances Act. So what are the differences between the original act and the amended act? The original act allowed NIA to investigate and prosecute offences within India but the amended act empowered the agency to investigate offences committed even outside India subject to international treaties and domestic laws of other countries. When it comes to the NIA, originally they could have looked into the Atomic Energy Act, Unlawful Activities Act of 19 1967 and Anti-Hijacking Act but the amendment included more areas of operation. This included human trafficking, counterfeiting currency, manufacture or sale of prohibited arms, cyber terrorism, offences under the Explosive Substances Act of 1908. Original Act constituted the special coach for conducting the trial of offences under the Act but the 2019 amendment allowed the central government to designate Sessions Court as a special court for the trial of scheduled offences under the Act. These are some of the differences between the original act which was passed in 2008 and the recently amended NIA Act. Now the question is, when will the National Investigation Agency take up a case? Let's say for example, we have all these offences. If there is an offence conducted under any of these acts, the state government may refer a case to the National Investigation Agency. If the state government does not refer, but if the central government feels that the National Investigation Agency should look into this case, then on a suomoto basis, the central government can refer such a case to the National Investigation Agency. So the state government can refer to the National Investigation Agency and you also have the central government which should also be able to take it on a suomoto basis as well. So where the central government finds that a scheduled offence has been committed at any place outside India to which this act extends, it can also direct the NIA to register the case take up the investigation while investigating any scheduled offence, the agency can also investigate any other offence with respect to this incident. 
this is what we have to understand with respect to the national investigation agency now let's look into the next start this article says strains on india russia defense cooperation the article here is speaking about defense cooperation between india and russia we have had a very good relationship with russia and it is russia which has traditionally and historically provided us all the arms and ammunitions but over a period of time ever since we had the russian invasion of ukraine what we have is trouble getting some of these equipments and ammunitions is what is this article all about and it goes on to provide other alternatives as well as of now the defense trade between india and russia has crossed 15 billion since 2018 india has brought major defense platforms like s400 long range air defense systems from russia other major contracts include construction of self frigates in russia for india license production of the mango armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabo T-90 tanks and AK-203 assault rifles among others in India. Deals have also been established with Russia with respect to MIG-29 fighter jets. Su-30 MK aircraft are also a notable defense deal between India and Russia. Added to it, there has been a delay in the delivery of 2nd Regiment of X-400 and the operationalization of the agreement for the manufacture of AK-203 rifles in India. Several big ticket deals that have been deferred by the Defense Ministry as part of the review view of all direct import deals this include deal of ka31 early warning helicopters igla as very short range air defense system the manufacturer of 200 k226 utility helicopters in india is also under consideration as well so basically this article currently goes on to say that we have had this historical relationship with russia we have gone ahead to establish this trusting relationship and in the past they have been able to provide us all arms and ammunitions but right now because they themselves have engaged in a war in ukraine they are not able to supply spares and ammunitions to india India can make a request but Russia is already engaged in a war since it is focusing on its own war it may not be in a condition to provide us the required spares and ammunitions. So this article currently goes on to say that since India requires a lot of ammunitions, arms and other equipment, it cannot rely on Russia alone but has to diversify. We have already diversified but this has to be enhanced in the near future says this article. But for now, to overcome this issue, what India can do is ask Russia to other its agreed timelines push Russia to give us the required ammunitions by leveraging its special relationship with Russia and through communication at the highest official channel. Then the article speaks about plan for alternative mitigation measures. What do we mean by it? Let's assume we require the arms and ammunitions. Let's say there is shortage of these arms and ammunitions and we would be able to manage it only for few days, let's say 10 days or 20 days or one month. So for this one month, we would be able to use it. But after that, we may not be able to use it. So what we have to look at is alternatives. That is, other friendly countries should be contacted. We should also be able to import these equipments from them. And at the same time, we should allow the private sector in India to develop on its own way as well. So incentives, tax benefits, tax holidays should have to be given to these private sector so that in the near future, we become Atma Nirbhar even with respect to the defense sector as well. So this article currently goes on to say that Russia has done everything that it possibly can in the past. But right now, because it is engaged in its own war, it may not be able to give us all these equipment on time and India may become the major sufferer because of it. So we have to make sure that we have alternative sources and at the same time envision what is called as Atma Nirbhar Bharata with reference to the defense sector. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the main practice questions. Use of technology by law enforcement agency can act as a force multiplier but can never be an alternative to compassionate policing based on trust between the police and citizens. Substantiate. Human activities are important factors that trigger landslides. Discuss measures to reduce the chance of landslides. So please write all your answers on the comment section. Peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.